31, welcome to section 6.4. We're going to learn how to graph logarithmic functions in this section. So we'll start out by talking about the domain of a logarithmic function, and then we're actually gonna go graph them. But I wanna start with this first trait of domain because this will be our third domain issue. And just to remind you, all semesters, we all semester, excuse me, we've been talking about our three domain issues, right? The first one we ran into was fractions, right, where the denominator was zero. We had radicals, right, when you had a radical with an even index and a negative radicand, that was a problem. And we're finally getting to our third domain issue, which is a logarithm. And you're going to hear me repeat in this section that the argument must be positive, meaning it has to be positive, although that's what I just said, it has to be positive, it has to be greater than zero, it cannot be equal to zero, and it ca cannot be negative. So it's got to be strictly greater than zero, and that's slightly different than the um, domain issue we come across with radicals. When you have an even indexed radical, your argument, or excuse me, your radicand has to be greater than or equal to zero here, and in logarithms it has to be strictly greater than zero. All right, so we're going to look at our basic logarithmic function. So there's nothing fancy attached to this. We'll, we'll start shifting and stretching this. But here's your, your parent function for a logarithm. So log base b of x. Again, this is not multiplication. There's parentheses around this because the logarithm is its own function. So this is log of x, technically log base b. So this is the exponent you need on b to get to x. All right, so for any real number x and any positive constant that's not equal to one, we can see the following characteristics for the graph of the logarithm base b of x. It is a one-to-one -one function, all right? We will have a vertical asymptote at zero. And you'll also hear me repeat in this section, you will always have a vertical asymptote when your argument is equal to zero. So we're very, very concerned or very curious about when the argument is equal to zero because that's where vertical asymptotes will occur. All right, the domain is going to be anything from zero to infinity because that's when this argument would quite literally be greater than zero. The range is all real numbers. The x-intercept is one zero and I had talked about the x-intercept before, meaning if you took the logarithm and your argument was one, the exponent was always going to be zero. So that's why we have this x-intercept of one comma zero. When I plug one into the function, I get zero back out. And we had also mentioned in 6.3, a property that comes up often enough. When you plug in b to your argument, when the base of your logarithm and the base of your power are the same, the only thing that survives is the exponent, so when I plug b into this, log base b of b is equal to one, and that becomes a key point on your graph. All right, we don't typically have y-intercepts because if you'll look, zero is not in my domain. Okay, so I don't have a y-intercept. Now again, if I stretch and shift things, I could have a y-intercept, but for your parent function, you don't have that y-intercept you're going to have logarithmic growth if your base is greater than one, and you can see it right here. And you're going to have logarithmic decay if your base is a fraction between zero and one. Now, logarithmic growth, you are growing, but you're growing at a ridiculously small rate. Exponential growth is the kind of growth that grows super duper fast. And logarithmic growth is, is super duper slow. If you look at the two graphs, if you were to look at log base b of x and b to the x, they're inverse functions one, with one another. They are reflections over the line y equaling x. All right, so before we head into our first examples where we're looking at the domain, I wanna go back to that trait table that we've been taking a look at, and I wanna go all the way to the right here and look at logarithmic functions. So when we talk about logarithmic functions, we can ha either have ln, log, or any old base. Um, you see me putting ln and log here because these are the most two are the two most common types of logarithms. This actually is the common logarithm. This is the natural logarithm. You could have any polynomial in your argument. 
You could have a rational function in your argument. You could actually have an exponential function in your argument. You can put anything in your argument, anything that combines the three types of functions that we had looked at previously. Right? We had looked at exponentials, we had looked at rationals, we had looked at polynomials. All right, so when it comes to these logarithmic functions, as I mentioned, the domain of any logarithmic function, well, we need the argument to be positive. Or another way of saying that is the argument of a logarithm cannot be negative or zero. All right, and then any y-intercept, it comes the way it all, or we get the y-intercept the way we always do. You let x equal zero. Well, it's possible you won't have a y-intercept for these logarithms. If it zeroes out your argument, you're not going to have a y-intercept. And so we would just say does not exist or possible d and e. You don't have a logarithm, or excuse me, you don't have a y-intercept on ln x. You don't have something like ln of x cubed minus x. And as we just saw in our parent function, we didn't have a y-intercept here. Okay. Now, for the x-intercept, you would let y equal 0. So if we go with our parent function, I'm asking you to figure out when is log base b of x equal to 0. Well, if I changed this into my exponential equation or into its equivalent exponential form, I would get b to the x, excuse me, b to the 0 equaling x, and that would tell me when is x equal to 1. So another way of looking for x-intercepts is to figure out when is your argument equal to 1. Whenever your argument is equal to 1, the exponent will be 0, and that will give you an x-intercept. All right, now for n behavior, we have to have a chat about this. n behavior, it's a combination of maybe arrows or horizontal asymptote, or I want to really hone in on the fact that there could be no end behavior depending on the domain. So let me go back to our parent function. And let's just take a look at the end behavior for each of these functions, whether we have logarithmic growth or logarithmic decay. So if you'll look here, all right, it, and keep in mind, do, my domain is 0 to infinity. And we've always talked about end behavior when we say as x goes to negative infinity and as x goes to positive infinity, right? And we're always wondering, what does f of x do? All right, I'm going to start with the right end because positive infinity is in my domain. So as x goes to infinity, as I move right, you can see my y values are headed up. They're headed up slowly, but they are headed up. All right, so this would be right end up. Now, as x goes to negative infinity, I want you to notice that as x goes to negative infinity, meaning as I go left, I have no graph because negative infinity is not in my domain. So we would say there was no end behavior on the left, and then it was right arrow up. So similar to exponential functions, we have two different things happening on each end. What's very unique to the logarithmic functions is that frequently there is no end behavior on one of the ends. And it's on the end where an infinity is not included. So you see I'm missing a negative infinity in my domain, so I have no left end behavior. I do have a positive infinity, which is why I had some right end behavior. And the same thing would be true for this logarithmic decay function. There's no end behavior on the left, and this one is right end down, because I'm decreasing, I'm decaying logarithmically. All right, now for vertical asymptotes, I'm going back to my trait table. All right, so I wanna to go to vertical asymptotes. They occur wherever your argument is zero. So if you're keeping track, and I know it's a lot to take in, we will frequently set our argument to zero to find vertical asymptotes and set our argument to one to find x-intercepts. All right, holes won't be likely unless I made your argument a rational function and I really don't feel like doing that just yet. All right, and then these are our basic graphs. These are logarithmic growths. Again, very, very slow growth. You, you, logs grow ridiculously slow, whereas exponential functions go ridiculous, grow ridiculously fast. All right, so with that, let's start in on how we find the domains of a couple of these functions. So I'm going to scooch this up, and let's take a look at examples one and two. So here, it says, what is the domain of this function? Now, when I hear domain, I think, okay, do I have a fraction? No. Do I have a radical? No. Do I have a logarithm? Yes. Here it is. And there is my argument. 
So when I say argument, that's a fancy vocab term for stuff in the parentheses. So in order to solve this, I need x minus 1 to be greater than 0. Well, we've solved linear inequalities before. I'm going to get, well, that's when x is greater than 1. If it helps, you could graph this on a number line. If you can go right to interval notation, you can skip this number line, but I don't want to skip it, just in case folks need to see the visual. All right, so I will go to 1. I would put an open dot and I would go all the way to the right. And when I go to the right, that's infinity. So let me scooch this up just a wee bit more. So I have some room to write. I would say then that the domain of this function began at one. I don't want to include it because I need my argument to be strictly positive. If I were to plug one back into my domain, excuse me, back into my argument, my argument would zero out and I can't take the logarithm of, of a zero. All right, so my domain is one to infinity. And just consequentially, we're gonna find a vertical asymptote at x equaling one. So wherever your argument, excuse me, wherever your argument zeroes out, that's where the vertical asymptotes will occur. All right, taking a look at example two, again, domain. I say, all right, I've got a function. Do I have a fraction? No. Do I have a radical? No. Do I have a logarithm? Yes. Now, I don't see any base here, so it's understood that we're talking about the common logarithm, but I need my argument to be strictly positive. So I want to know when is x minus 5 greater than 0. If I add 5 to both sides, that's when x is greater than 5. Again, I'm going to go ahead and just draw a number line so we have a visual on this. I've got 5 with an open dot here. I'm going to shade to the right because it's greater than. That'll go up to infinity. And I will say my domain is from 5, not inclusive, to infinity. I also just want to show you another notation that you might come across. You don't have to write this, but if you ever see something like this, it's a different way of writing what you just did here. It's tacking on this x, and this is lowercase e in the Greek alphabet, that's epsilon. Let me scooch that up a little bit more so you can see it. All right, um, so this is epsilon. It just means any x value inside this interval is part of my domain. So for every x, that's an element of the interval from five to infinity, I'm allowed to plug those in for x. All right, so that's your first look at domain. With that, I'm gonna hop over to an example where we're, we're gonna graph one of these together. All right, I'll see you in a bit, bye.